Uh, good morning, everyone. Buckle up, because today we're going to go on a journey into the idea of meritocracy. So if you are interested into the future of the tech industry, then you are in the right place. And this talk may be interesting to you. So first I start with presenting myself. Who am I? My, who am I? I am Sara. My name is Sara. I have been working in the tech industry for the past 13 years. As a full-time job, I work in the cloud and DevOps industry, but on, on, on the side of that, additionally, I've also been working with tech communities since 2016. And as Flo already mentioned, I am co-founder and director of tech of C-Sharp, a nonprofit foundation that makes it easier for women and non-binary individuals to enter, stay, and grow in the tech industry. I've been co-founder, sorry, co-organizer of Serverless Days Amsterdam uh, community, a meetup as well. I volunteered for Act Your Future, another community based in Amsterdam. But I also, throughout the years, I collaborated through speaking, through uh, co-organizing events, through supporting, endorsing, and so on, with other communities, both in Amsterdam and worldwide, because communities are important to me. Uh, Foremost. So what will we talk about today? Today we're going to uh, dive into the ideal of meritocracy and we're going to kind of look at what are our industry pra practices as a tech industry, how are we doing in that sense, uh, what are our assumptions and our, 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 our assumptions confirmed or not? Uh, so is uh, the ideal, how does the ideal compare versus the reality of our industry? And what are, in that case, the barriers or the ladders that kind of um, are not what we expect them to be? And what, uh, most importantly, at the end, I will talk about what can we do collectively to foster a better industry for everyone. So, what is meritocracy? Meritocracy is the ideal or the belief system that people in the tech industry, but in general, are rewarded, rewarded and advanced based on their skills, their ability, their passion, their hard work. So we have this core belief that in an ideal world, this is how things should work. Sounds like a dream, right? But if we pause one second to reflect, is it an ideal? Is it an utopia? Is it a reality? Like, what is it? So I mentioned meritocracy also as a belief system. This is important because our belief systems inform uh, the, way, the way we behave, they have a huge impact on our lives and our work. So meritocracy, meritocracy may inform the way how we hire people, how we promote talent, how we develop talent as well, how we assign projects like high visibility projects to somebody or offer leadership opportunities, how we evaluate the performance of individuals, how we allocate resources and funding to, invest, to uh, people who want to start their own startup, for example. And how do we recognize and award talent and hard work? And lastly, but also important, how we determine compensations and bonuses based on performance. So let's think about outliers. So extremely successful people in the tech industry, people that we see as our role models, the top of the top, the people that we look up to, think about their stories. What do they have in common? Are they diverse? Are they looking the same? For sure they have in common that they work hard, they are talented, they are charismatic, and 
it makes me think maybe I have a doubt. Is their success a result of exceptional talent, exceptional hard work that they, they, they showed, or also a result of exceptional opportunities that they got in their lives? Let's think about it. So let's reflect about this last question that I asked. We all play a role in the tech industry. As individual contributors, as managers, we are colleagues, we are peers, we manage people, we work together with people, and our actions, our decision making, our beliefs also have an impact on how people around us are treated. But also the same, the opposite applies, like the way people think, the way people behave has an impact on us. So in that sense, when we think about the way we behave, we may have good intentions, but we might also have unconscious biases. So unconscious biases are, thing, are uh, aspects that we're not very aware of, things that we do subconsciously. And these biases may, have, may affect the way we behave. In particular, they affect the way how we perceive others and situations around us. Um, for example, we may have biases around certain genders or ethnicities. We might unconsciously interpret the same behavior differently depending on who is performing it. And this, unfortunately, can lead on misjudgments about somebody's abilities, intentions, or characters, or the character. Biases have a, an impact on attention. So they influence the way we notice the people around us, the details around us, and, the, and also affect what we overlook around us. We might pay more attention to behavior that confirm what we want to see. Or um, it depends also who is performing it as well. And uh, we can also ignore those that maybe contradict what we want to believe. So this selective attention reinforces a bit our um, belief systems as well. So biases also affect the way we interpret the reality around us. So the way we interpret information, for instance, the feedback that is given by someone uh, that we have a positive bias um, towards, this might be, this feedback might seem constructive, but maybe somebody else that I don't really like, the feedback might sound really not useful or unproductive, and that obviously has an effect on the way we interact with these people. Biases have an impact on memory, so affect, biases affect what we remember. And uh, in fact, we are more likely to remember information that al aligns with our core belief system and forget what we don't want to remember. Um, we have what is called uh, selective memory. Another important aspect that is um, affected by biases is decision making. Again, if you're a hiring manager, if you're a leader, a VP or a C-level, in a professional sen setting, these, these biases can influence the way you hire, the way you promote people, the way you evaluate people. And you may favor candidates versus others, depending on their background or characteristics. Or as a, the higher you are in the chain, if you're like a leader, you can influence the creation and design of policies in your organization. And lastly, biases affect our day-to-day -day interactions with others. This can lead to not very um, constructive behaviors or positive behavior, so-called microaggressions or even worse, uh, or also preferential treatment, which is the opposite side, the positive side. And these affect the, the way we relate to each other and we communicate with each other. So there's different layers to this that we need to take into account. But I mentioned positive and negatives, but let's have a look at other aspects that can have an impact on our individual success. The education, so for instance, the 
the type of schools that we were uh, that we um, the, the, that we were students of when we were younger, like our uh, educational background, like uh, the prestige of your school may have an impact um, towards the visibility in, in a interviewing a pool of candidates. The way you were brought up by your parents, your family background, did your parents uh, taught you to be assertive, to share what you want to uh, achieve in a workplace, um, so your background and the way you were um, yeah, brought up by your parents has an impact also on the way you behave later in adulthood. When and where you, you grew up also has an impact because this opens up a different set of opportunities. Um, there is a reason why uh, young people, may, uh, for instance, some Italian, there is a, what's so called like the escape of uh, the brains we say in Italy, so people try to um, migrate somewhere else to find opportunities that maybe in Italy were not found. This is an example, but this is a worldwide phenom phenomenon, like escape of talent. Um, Socioeconomic background, that is something that we are all aware of, like the wealth, our wealth, and our um, access to uh, opportunities that come with better financial situation, this has a huge impact into the opportunities that we have over our whole life. And also the stress of not having to think about paycheck to paycheck, this also has an impact on, I see somebody no nodding, um, if your priority is to live uh, to survive every month, you have less time to focus on growing your own skills and your own abilities, and that obviously impacts your opportunities. And also your current employment. So career switchers, people who want to transition to tech, might also have an impact on their success because they might be as skilled as somebody who is already in the, in the tech industry but relatively new, but because they are kind of uh, switching into tech, the hiring manager may have a bias against somebody that is switching careers into tech. So there's different factors that play a role. So let's have a look at this list as well. So if we're thinking about what skill set bring what outcomes, we are thinking about a, a, a quite, a, quite a list, because if we want to achieve, for instance, promotion, bonuses, and uh, pay, uh, pay raise, and so on, and also get the job that we want, we need to have certain skills. And obviously, not everybody checks all the boxes. But uh, I, let's go through this list. So we need to be, as, let's say, a, a person in the tech industry, you need to be able to uh, Set, quote unquote, say yourself in job interviews. And after you're hired, you need to have the skills to build the great products as well. Um, if you want to remain, remain relevant in the tech industry, you have to be able to continuously upskill yourself to be still hireable and also to bring value to your own company and so forth. Um, during your tenure, you also have to need to have the ability to recognize and leverage the opportunities in your workplace. This is not a given. Not everybody has the same ability to see, uh, understand, okay, this could be a great career opportunity. Let me catch it. This is a, another skill set. You need to also be able to understand what are the expectations that your manager has about you. And when you interact with others, you need to be able to pitch your ideas to others, whether you are a, a startup, startup founder, whether you are a, um, a person that wants to uh, drive an architectural choice in your, um, in your um, organization, on your team, when you want to pitch an idea to others, you need to be able to do that effectively. So you need to be able to be persuasive, influence others at different levels, not only your peers, but if you want to grow in your tech career, you need to be able also to influence stakeholders that are leaders in your organization. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for you to grow, especially at higher levels. You need to be able to know how to make your work visible 
that's also not a given because you need to uh, make sure it, doing the right things and be great at your job may not be enough to give you the outcomes that you want because if nobody else knows it, if your work is not visible, then you don't get the reward, you don't get the recognition that you deserve. And that's something that I've seen many times as well, the vi lack of visibility around somebody's work. And this is a mix between, the last one is a mix between um, personality, attitude, learned skills, but also uh, up upbringing, as I mentioned, the way your parents brought you, your, your culture as well. So being able to ask for what you want, that's also a skill set. And I can go on, I can go on, but I wanna stop a second and think about the ideal of meritocracy, as I mentioned it before, that, ev that we should be able to reward fairly talent based on hard work, skills, and passion. But then if we zoom in into what's needed to actually succeed in the tech industry, that list is quite long, and I don't know anybody who checks all the boxes. For sure, I don't know anybody who checked all the boxes at the beginning of their career. So how do we get to check more boxes? Or the question is, what could be barriers that prevent us from checking some of these boxes? There are factors and aspects of our identities they play a role in our individual success. There is race, for instance, ethnicity, skin color, gender, sexual orientation, ability, age, religion, body size. This is not a finished list. The list is bigger than this. But I want to also make it clear that if we look at the way, if we look at the people who are more successful in the tech industry, there is not really a huge diversity when we look at all the lists of different identity backgrounds and dimensions. We may acknowledge this. And I'm gonna share a bit of data in a bit. But before I do that, I mentioned that I'm gonna share some data. I wanna make a disclaimer. During this presentation, I will talk a lot about gender and related studies and, and research, and I might also talk about some intersection between genders, uh, gender and other um, aspects. But I want to be clear when I say this, obviously men also experience barriers, especially men who belong to underrepresented groups, right? So based on race, ethnicity, skin color, sexual orientation, and so on. The, during this presentation, I reference studies because I want to really be explicit about the gaps that we have. But this is not an inclusive um, representation of all the different dimensions. So I just wanna make it clear. One thing that everybody for sure knows in this, in this room is that women are underrepresented in the tech roles in Europe but worldwide, for sure. And think about the, 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 the people who are around you when, at your job, on your day-to-day -day job. Are they mostly women? I don't think so. So this is actually quite visible, apparent. And uh, women, uh, in Europe at least, women held only 22% of all the tech roles in European companies. And when we think about the roles of our colleagues, of our female colleagues, what kind of roles do they cover? We found research, um, so McKinsey did this research actually, where we found they, found, they found that uh, the percentage of women in technical roles, which are specifically developers or data engineers, are lower than others. And the lowest participation rates, and that makes me sad given the co conference, is uh, in DevOps and cloud roles with 8% and in compute and operational roles, 50%, 15%. So that is something that is quite visible. And when we look at the, um, if we look at this image, we can see how women are also underrepresented in top manager position 
in the Netherlands, in Europe, but also worldwide. I mentioned intersectionality, and indeed, women's statistics get even worse when we consider women of color specifically. So nearly in every step of the pipeline in the, in the, in the process, the representation of women of color falls really behind when it comes to the comparison with white women and men of the same race and, et and ethnicity. So women represent roughly one in four C-suit leader and women of color just one in 16. And only 1% of C-level executives are Latina. So this is a study that was done in the US, by the way, also from McKinsey. And let's have a look at LGBTQ plus people who are also together with transgender and non-binary people they face workplace discrimination that then have a huge impact on their workplace participation. And indeed, um, discrimination that occurs also as an info of how they feel, so they fear of being discriminated and they, their career choices are also affected, obviously. And people belonging to this group also work, tend to choose where to work based on past discrimination and fear of discrimination. So they are very uh, selective and uh, trying to understand before joining a company whether this, this company is safe or not. So as a company, you miss talent, potential ta talent that is uh, potentially bringing value to your company by not having policies that protect this group. And when we look at women with disabilities, another intersection, women with disabilities are less uh, employed uh, compared to men with disability of the same age group. But also when we look at uh, full-time employment, only 20% of women with disability are in full-time employment compared to 29% of men with disability, 48% of women without disability, these disabilities and 64% of men without disabilities. So this, uh, 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 this being, uh, um, uh, being a person with disability obviously uh, has, uh, has an impact on your uh, career prospect as well. So how do we explain this? What did you hear? Like these are things that probably shouldn't su surprise you as statistics, but when we talk with others, we sometimes hear people explaining the situation in different ways. So we have our own mental model in which we kind of try to interpret the world around us. What will be an answer? Why, why does this happen? So sometimes we hear people, I hear people, we hear people t t thinking, well, women don't have the capability to do those jobs. Another answer is, well, Maybe women are just not interested in tech roles. A different answer could be maybe women possess both the capability and the interest, but are stopped by the, by the so-called glass ceiling, which is a group of barriers, systematic barriers that blocks them from achieving their full potential. And if you think about it from the company perspective, even just from like a business perspective, this means that there is a huge untapped talent that is facing barriers and is not able to fulfill their full potential and bring potentially also value to the industry and your company. So let's have a look at hiring, hiring um, as a practice. The ideal candidate from the mental model of meritocracy would be somebody who is passionate, hardworking, and possessing all the right skills, check, checking all the boxes, right? And in an ideal world, let's think about it from the company perspective. If we want this talent to be recognized and hired, then we need the company to know very well what are the must-have job requirements, we need the company to know how to write ex uh, effective job descriptions that reach the right talent. 
The company needs to know, uh, when I say company, I mean a group of individ individuals, part of the hiring process, like an hiring manager or so on, a recruiter. So the company needs to know which the requirements are more important compared to others. So what are the must have skills that we need? The company needs to have an effective process for a resume filtering. So making sure that we get the right talent in the pipeline. And the company needs to have a structured interview process. And I want to ask you, did you ever find a company that ticked all these boxes? <laughs> Well, if you find it, that, that, tell me. Um, so as you can already see that our ideal, maybe it's has some fallacies, right? We're not there yet. Maybe I'm spawning a little bit, but I, I got the feeling that we are, we are not there for sure. Um, I mentioned the fact that by uh, unconscious biases um, affect the way we perceive other people so, and the reality around us. So for instance, a study has found that women are perceived as less competent and less hireable and less deserving of a higher salary compared to men. We also, uh, studies also have found that the standards in which we hire, so I mentioned at the begin uh, a, few, a couple of slides ago, around, okay, what are our requirements? What are the must-haves versus the nice-to-have? Studies have found that these standards, these benchmarks are quite fluid, not only in the industry, but in the same company and also for the same hiring manager. So what do I mean with that? So studies have found that managers sometimes, not always, this means sometimes, may adjust the definition of merit to fit the unique qualification of the applicant from preferred groups. And I want to clarify, managers may do this with good intention. This doesn't necessarily need to, it's, it's not necessarily something that people do consciously with the goal of arming people. Uh, many hiring managers have the best intentions, but they do this because maybe uh, they have their bias that, um, oh, I like, I like this guy, he's a nice guy, I think he would be a great fit. And that, that is something that I heard as well, it's quite, quite normal because we, we, when we like a person, we want this person to fit, uh, to, to, to be part of our team, right? Then also the standards, uh, so we, we were talking about uh, hard work and skills and when it comes to skill set, Studies have found that actually high achieving men benefit from their grades in hiring, in early career talent, while high achieving women often don't. So the, the standards are applied not in the same way. And also, um, sometimes managers may change the job criteria, leading to different job outcomes for men and for women. So, this is, I want to reiterate, this comes from good intention. This is something that happens without us not even realizing it. But it's important for us to realize that this happens. Otherwise, how can we achieve a more fair and just industry if we don't know this, these kind of things? So let's have a look at performance reviews. In an ideal world, when it comes to performance reviews, the company has the right visibility over the employee's output. The company has a clear performance evaluation criteria, which is known both to the managers and the employees. In an ideal world, the performance evaluation criteria are consistently applied. And again, in an ideal world, the company has a structure pro structured process for evaluation. Do you know any company that is raising the bar in that sense or checked all the boxes all the time? I mean, I mean this is not, uh, uh, like, the list is longer than this, but I would be curious. So again, our 
ideal of meritocracy is getting kind of blurred and kind of the ideas sound a bit uh, not as easy as it sounded at the beginning of this talk. Let's dive a deep deeper about benchmarking in performance evaluations. So the way we like to be benchmarked typically, so studies have found that the way we like to be benchmarked is that we want to be compared with our past evaluations, not with others. And this is a, an approach that we consider fair compared to others. So we, we consider evaluation as fair if they match my, my actual uh, performance and we want to see how did we grow over time. We don't want to see how we compare with others. So this is something that it's important to take into account because uh, this is a study that um, wanted to probe the perception from the um, employee perspective, but not all companies apply this standard, obviously. So how do we engage in performance reviews? It's important to take into account that, for instance, uh, men are generally more likely to talk about their achievement and their ability than women. So I mentioned the visibility of your work. There is this double bind uh, uh, um, uh, concept, which is essentially if women show traits that are more masculine, stereotypically masculine, like very assertive, uh, dominant, and um, like, yeah, traits that are more uh, associated with male leadership in the workplace. Women fa face backlash, but when they don't do this and they want to be promoted and they want, and they want to grow in their company, they risk, they're actually more likely to be ignored. So there is not a win situation here. Another interesting um, aspect that affects performance evaluation is that sometimes women choose to stay behind the scene to uh, engage in a so-called intentional invisibility. And they do this to avoid conflict and backlash that in a way so that they can continue to maintain balance, at work, balance between work and family, but also maintaining authentic authenticity at work knowing that this will potentially affect their career opportunity. Because of course, we, we talked about visibility and this is, this is um, obviously uh, an imp impediment barrier. And of course, parent parenthood also has an impact on the way we uh, evaluate people because um, there is the so-called motherhood penalty. So working mom, mom, mothers are seen as warm, but less competent, these obviously hurts their job prospects, both in um, hiring process, but also in performance evaluations. While on the same time, working dad, the fathers, they gain the warmth that comes with parenthood without losing the competence perception that other, others have of them. So this is not, uh, not helping women. Another important aspect is the double shifts. So mothers are much like, more likely to do housework and childcare than fathers. During the pandemic, this got worse because this burden increased and mothers have uh, had three times more likely than fathers to handle more housework and caregiving. So COVID and the pandemic also had a huge impact negatively on the workforce and the female workforce. So, um, this is also a, a map that shows what is the average daily time spent by women on domestic work, which is quite a lot. If you think about it, the outliers, very successful careers, sec people who are your role models in the tech industry, they most likely work a lot over time. And clearly that because of how companies and our work place are designed, sometimes this is not evitable. And if you need to do the double shift, if you're a woman that needs to do the double shift, this has an impact because you are not in a better situation than your male counterpart because you have additional housework to do. 
at home. And also something that is not a great uh, finding is having children also impacts your pay as well. So you're, if you're a woman or a man who, have, who has no children or men who don't, your earnings kind of stay the same after the first child, but for women, this has a significant drop. And if you are earning less after your first child, and you have to take, for instance, the decision with your partner, well, uh, should, we, um, should we put our children in childcare, uh, or should it be a stay-at-home parent? If your earnings drop after having the first child, sometimes, financially, the couple may decide that the woman will stop working because it makes more sense financially. And this is an unfortunate reality, of, of course. So, the next thing that I want to talk about is, okay, I, I talk about all this, this, this thing, and maybe the solution is, okay, we need to change our workplace policy to really emphasize the concept of meritocracy. This should be in our company culture. This sounds like a potential idea that a company has. Yes, let's make it, we don't want to see stuff like this. We should have equal opportunities for everybody. Everybody should have, uh, the, everybody should be able to fulfill their potential. So let's make it clear in our company culture that we really want to be meritocratic. Well, what happens there? The paradox of meritocracy. When an organization promotes meritocracy, managers may ironically show more biases, favoring men over equally performing women by giving men larger rewards. And that because the company culture does not challenge the biases that everybody has, because we all have biases, right? I have biases, you folks have biases, but the company culture does not explicitly challenge or acknowledge those biases. It just says we are meritocratic. So in the mind of managers, we're like, this is a very just company. So I am legitimate in my decision and I am confident that I will take a fair and just um, decision in this hiring process or like rewarding talent. So, Putting meritocracy in our company culture and our pro uh, pro um, processes is not the right answer yet. When it comes to promotions, in an ideal world, the company has a clear criteria for promotions, uh, consistently applies those promotion criteria, ensures visibility of employees' achievement and potential as a structured and transparent promotion process. Again, if you being work, have you ever worked in a company that ticked all the boxes? I don't hear a yes, so uh, sounds like it's difficult. So there are barriers on multiple levels. Um, unfortunately, women are in technological roles are promoted l much less often than men early in their careers, and that leaves obviously to live in the field. Another uh, unfortunate aspect is that um, as an industry, we overemphasize, overemphasize on the value of mentorship, which is the process of somebody giving us advice, career advice, where we don't really pay enough attention to the uh, value of sponsorship, which is somebody who is advocating for us and sharing with us uh, the right um, uh, job opportunities and speaking on our behalf and say great things on our behalf when we're not there. So advocating for us. And so underestimating sponsorship, the role of sponsorship has also as, as an impact on women. And sometimes even women decide to avoid it because they don't want to feel self-serving and gossip, uh, facing gossip. 
And there is also the concept of gendered oldism or youngism. So women in leadership faced ageism at every stage of their career, with younger women being dismissed as an experience and older women viewed as less valuable, leading to never right age bias. So we want to drive a change. But what can happen? What do, do we usually hear? Why are we resistant to changes? We hear, oh, but sometimes it's not a priority to, uh, for us. We feel that we don't have the right time, uh, that we don't have the time or energy. Oh, we don't know where to start. Um, we don't really know. But in general, sometimes we may worry about losing access to benefits, like if we really dive deep, into the reason why we don't want to drive changes around us and positive changes. We are a bit worried maybe that we may lose access to benefits or opportunities ourselves. We may have concern that changes will apply, will alter the rules that we really like. We are very used to the way we are doing. We don't want to change it. Or we are also afraid of somebody's, somebody accusing us because maybe we belong to a privileged group and we're like, oh, we don't want to be blamed for the barriers, the systematic barriers that exist. But there are ways in which you can drive, you as part of the industry, you can drive positive changes around you. And again, I focus on gender, but that applies to race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and so on. By acknowledging who benefits the most from the current cultural processes in your company, and also acknowledge that the turnover costs are very high if, if they are not implement, these processes are not implemented optimally. You need to take a data-driven uh, approach to changes, to track progress, but also to understand the visibility on what needs to be done. So you need, as a company, as a leader, as a, as a tech industry uh, employee, you need to employ metrics to benchmark and track progress. Progress and status around attrition rate, the performance, the processes, the promotions, the leadership pipeline, the employment pipeline, the pay, the workforce representation. You have the power to drive those changes. Everybody has. And when it comes to fairness, when it comes to um, rating and rewards, you need to develop processes and guidelines because good intentions are not enough. You need to ensure that this application of these standards are applied consistently across all business units and teams. You need to train managers and leaders to understand what are these biases. I mentioned a few of them, but the list is very long. But it is possible, it's a journey, it is possible to educate ourselves. Um, you, it's important that you implement fair procedure throughout your employee's career, not just at the performance evaluation, but at every stage of an employee history throughout the company. And you need to ensure the reviews are of similar lengths for all employees to provide equal detail saying, oh yeah, I think this guy did a great job, or this, this woman did a great job, or yeah, I will hire this person because he's a nice person. Like, make sure that you're detailed and you, uh, as a manager, you, or interview feedback provider, you uh, explain, because by explaining and making sure that you give motivation, you are also challenged to, to think about your own biases make performance reviews and, perform and advice forward-looking because a lot of time people receive feedback that is not actionable, it's quite vague. So make sure that every time you provide that feedback in performances or uh, peer feedback, you make it forward-looking and related to the future. And don't provide feedback once in a while, but give feedback to others um, in, in a very periodic, uh, 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 like ongoing way. And outline specific criteria and behavior, uh, behaviors before evaluations. And make sure that the same criteria are applied for all employees at the same level. 
link feedback positive and de de developmental to business and goal business and goal outcomes sometimes we give feedback to others but we don't really explain why is this important for our business and this in has an impact on the career prospect of the person receiving the feedback. Um, and make sure that you equalize references to technical accomplishment and capabilities across employees, both male and female. So I gave some tips here. The list of tips, recommendations, policies, and processes that you can implement in your company is longer than this, and also the list of uh, barriers and ladders that happen within your organization is also wider than the scope of this talk. But you are free to learn more about this by going to this page and learn more about all the studies, all the research, all the articles that I mentioned and more are here. And remember, you have the power to drive change around you. And I hope that you will do after this talk. Thank you so much.